Well, today I've got the Samsung LN32B360. Wanted to go over some voltages and some troubleshooting tips with you real quick. This model uses the mainboard BN96-11408B. And the power supply and inverter board is BN44 dash zero zero two eight nine a this one uses a timing controller board LJ nine four dash zero three zero seven seven a so we'll start with some voltages from the power supply board when the set is in the standby or off condition. Now I wanted to real quickly touch base with you. A lot of uh, followers like to ask me, where do I put my negative lead, the black lead? Where do I attach that? Because in all my videos, I typically only use the red lead. And if you're new at this, you don't know exactly what to do. Uh, you want to find a common ground. The LCD panel, if it's a metal one like this, the back of it is grounded. It's common ground. So what I have is a short little jumper that I've made up with two alligator clips. And I will typically just clip uh, one end to the negative lead and then I'll clip the other end into a part of the LCD panel which is grounded. That's my cold ground. Don't confuse that with hot ground. Another location that's very good that I use many, many times for a ground is just one of the outer ground terminals of a audio or video jack. They're all tied to ground. And what I'm going to do is just touch the positive lead to the LCD panel. And we're in ohms. We have eight tenths of an ohm, which is a very low reading. That's a very good ground right there. Uh, if you wanted to, you could attach it even to uh, the outer connector of one of the HDMI cables. We'll go to ground again and measure it, 8 tenths of an ohm. Just for reference, let's just short the leads together. We have 5 tenths of an ohm resistance just in the leads itself. So effectively, I'm only seeing about 3 tenths of an ohm uh, to ground here. So that's a very good ground to use for your meter because most digital meters have a 10 mega ohm input, which is 10 million ohms. So the ratio between 3 tenths of an ohm and 10 million ohms is, it's negligible. It's not even worth mentioning at this point. So let me move the camera. We'll start with some voltages from the power supply board when the set is in the off or standby condition. Okay, so I'm at the power supply board right now. And the set is uh, plugged in, but it's not turned on yet. There's a little legend right here of, of what the pins are. So I'll explain to you what every pin means. Uh, the first one on the bottom, pin one, is power on off. That is the command from the main board to turn the power supply on. Second pin is labeled 5.3. And that's a standby voltage, which means you should have that at all times even when the set is off. That's what runs the microprocessor and the remote control receiver on the main board. Uh, pin three is ground. Pin four is uh, one, uh, 13 volts. Pin five is ground. Pin six is ground. Pin seven is labeled 5.3 volts. Pin eight is 5.3. Pin 9 is ground, pin 10 is 13 volts, pin 11 is 13 volts, pin 12 is inverter on off, oh, excuse me, inverter on off, pin 13 is E-PWM, pulse width modulation, and that's what controls the backlight in the TV. Pin 14 is the 5 volt detect, which if you're having a problem 
and you see that voltage uh, is incorrect, it sends a command back to the microprocessor that the power support power supply board is not working correctly. And pin 15 and pin 16 are both ground. Okay, so I have my probe on the power on off line right now. And I'm going to press the power button. And we'll see it, it comes up to 2.8 volts. So that's what you want to see on that power on off command to the main board or to the power supply from the main board. Okay, I've turned the set back off and right now I am on the inverter on off line, which is pin 12 on the legend here. I'm going to turn the set on. There, the backlight came on. Comes up to 5.08 volts. So that's what turns the inverter on and off. This is not an LED set. This has fluorescent lights in the, in the uh, LCD panel. So let's turn the set back off. And I'm going to move up one pin which is the E-PWM pulse width modulation and that changes the duty cycle of a square wave signal that controls the brightness of the LCD panel and I'm hoping when I turn this set on that we'll see this voltage come up and then gradually dim down most of them they come on bright and then they dim down so there I've just turned it on the LCD is not on yet it hasn't controlled the uh, inverter to turn on yet there it's on 3 volts, 3.5. Actually, this one's going to brighten up a little bit as it warms up. So it starts at about 3.5 volts. It goes to 4.28 volts. So if you're having a, a problem where the uh, screen is always in the dim position, even though you have the backlight turned up, monitor that line. You could actually go into the menu and adjust the backlight up or down. Whether this model actually allows you to do that is a different story, but... On most sites, you can control the backlight in the menu, and you should see this voltage ramp up and ramp down as you adjust the backlight control in the video menu on the TV. And just real quick, since I had most of my voltages, or all of my voltages on here, even when the set was off, it means it just went into a, a low current standby condition. It doesn't actually have multiple power supplies like some sets do. Some sets have a separate standby power supply and a separate run power supply. This one uses uh, just one main transformer. Right here, one main transformer. Uh, rectifies, filters it through these capacitors. So all the voltages were present on this set even when the set was in the standby condition. So it just folds the power supply back and runs it at a very low current because all it has to supply is a very low uh, current standby to the microprocessor and the remote control receiver when the set is off. So I'm not going to go over these voltages a second time with you. But let's real quickly talk about the input side of the power supply. I haven't done that on uh, some of these sets recently. Now one thing you want to be very careful of on a power supply like this is the hot and cold ground. In fact, this one actually tells you hot and cold here. So what you want to look for is this large white band. This side is the cold side, which means ground is the ground I previously showed you, the LCD panel, the jacks on the main board. Now if we come over to here, this is the hot side. So ground on this is the negative of the bridge rectifier and the negative of the main filter capacitor right here. So you can use the negative side as hot ground, or you can use the negative of the bridge rectifier down here. You can actually see the negative symbol right down here. That would be hot ground as well. So I'm going to turn the set back off. It's been running. And I'm going to very carefully put my probe up here on the main filter capacitor and we should look at the voltages there and see what we have. Okay, so here we are across the main filter capacitor and I see 162.6 volts. And what that is, 
it's the 120 approximately AC volts going in times 1.414. So if you notice my voltmeter says true RMS multimeter. And RMS is root mean square. And what that means is voltage from zero to peak in a sine wave is actually red. Uh, it's a simple formula you can use if you had an oscilloscope. You could take from zero or ground to peak, multiply, multiply that by 0 0.707, and that's your root mean square voltage, RMS. Because I'm using a full wave bridge rectifier in this set, we have to double that, 1.414. So real simply, if I take 115 volts approximately times 1.414, I end up with 162.61 volts. And I'm actually seeing 162.6 volts across the filter capacitor right here, so that's very close. That's what you want to see with the set off. If you had a different voltage here, then uh, you might want to look at your bridge rectifier. Uh, there's also some uh, RFI filtering down here, these coils and capacitors. There's a thermistor right here that is a, used for soft start. So let me get back up here real quick and I'll put my uh, probe back on the positive side of the capacitor. Be, be aware once again, I my negative is on hot ground. My positive is on the positive side of the capacitor, of course. Let's turn the set on and we'll look at the voltage. It goes up to 383 volts. That's a big difference. And now what that means is this little transformer right here has turned on, and that's called power factor correction, PFC. You'll see that in some service manuals. It'll just talk about the PFC circuit. Not many people know what power factor correction is. There's a couple really good videos if you want to investigate it out there. Uh, it's kind of hard to describe what power factor correction is. But when you have a pure resistive load, a resistor, uh, an incandescent light bulb, a heater, they have a power factor, power factor of one. And what that means is uh, one is basically 100%. Every bit of energy that the set uses or the device uses is used as the workforce. When you have an inductive load, like this set is, because it uses uh, coils and transformers and they have induction, that means that the current draw is slightly out of phase from the incoming current and that creates reflected power, which is wasted energy as heat. So what they've done here is they've added a little circuit here and it assures that it only draws current when the current is available. It doesn't try to draw excessive current when uh, the waveform is at a lower than peak waveform. So there's no wasted or reflected energy. Like I said, if you want to learn more about it, you could definitely Google power factor correction. And there's some great videos out there to explain in much more detail than I can. I'm, I'm a very much novice when I talk about power factor correction. So let's take a look at some voltages again now that we've got the set up and running. So this large connector across the top, this connects directly to the power supply. So I want to show you some voltages on these little IC regulator chips here. So let's start with this one right here, labeled IC501. That's the adjustment pin, 0.61 volts. The output is 1.8, and once again on these regulators, there's the input pin 5 volts, 4.79. You should see approximately 1.2 to 1.25 volts between the adjustment pin and the output pin. Now this one is labeled 3.3, so I should see ground on the adjustment pin, which I do. 3.3 volts, 3.27, close enough on the output pin and 4.8 volts or approximately 5 volts on the input pin. This one's just labeled 1117 which is a common part number for these little IC regulators 1117. 
zero volts. We should get 1.24 volts because the adjustment pin is grounded. So we should always have on a on a fixed, excuse me, on a an adjustable regulator, we should see about 1.25 volts between the adjustment pin, ground, and the output pin. And we see exactly that. Input pin is 3.3 volts. So they're taking the input of this regulator from the output of another regulator. Let's come over here and look at these. 12.8 volts. We see ground on that pin and output of 9 volts. This is a different type of regulator where the uh, tab is grounded. Some, some of the time the tab is an output, some of the time the tab is a ground. We've got 9 volts on the input and if you look at this little trace right here, you can see it connects directly to the output of this regulator. So this one feeds this one. Ground on the tab and 5 volts on the output of this one. And let's take a look at the keypad and remote control input real quick. Okay, let's start by looking at the voltages on this connector right here on the bottom of the main board. This connector serves the remote control receiver as well as the keypad, the mechanical key switches on this model. So let's look at pin one. I've got 5.25 volts. I've got my remote right here in my hand, so I'm gonna press one of the buttons and point it at the remote receiver. And I can see as I press the button, that voltage does fluctuate around which tells me that pin one is the remote control IR infrared input to the microprocessor. Uh, pin two, I've got zero volts. And now on pin three, I've got 5.26 volts and that's the power supply to the infrared remote control receiver. And pin four, I've got 1.9 volts, and that most likely goes to the LED. So let's turn the set on. And if it does, that set should kind of blink on and off. Yes, it does. Once the set's on, it should stop blinking. And it just stays low, which means that low is off, high is on. So let's turn the set back off. There it's off, it's at 1.9 volts, which means the little red LED is on. The next pin is 0.2 volts. I'm not sure what that is. Make sure I'm on there good. And now the next one is 3.27 volts. I'm gonna press one of the keys on the keypad. This is the menu button. It goes to 0.81 volts. Source takes me to 1.39 volts. And power takes me to zero volts. So let's go to the very next pin. This is pin seven. Now I'm gonna press volume down. I see 0.8 volts. Volume up is zero. Channel down is 2.11 volts. Channel up is 1.41. And the previous buttons that I press have no difference. These are called key scan lines. And this is set up as a ladder network of resistors. And based on the resistance back to the microprocessor on these two lines, it knows what button you are pressing. So if you're having a problem with random functions on these sets, which is fairly common on these Samsung sets, Take a look at these two lines and make sure they both hold steady at approximately 3.3 volts. If one of these two lines is lower than 3.3 volts without you pressing any buttons on the set, it means you have a leaky switch. The switches, the mechanical contact, they're called tact switches. The mechanical contact, they're silver plated and silver tends to want to tarnish a little bit over time and it can actually grow little whiskers on the silver and they're, they become conductive and they have a little tiny bit of resistance which can simulate a key press and on these sets the microprocessor gets busy it thinks you're pressing one of the keys continuously so it keeps trying to process that command and it can actually lock you out of things like manual power button, other button operation and the remote control receiver. 
So let's take a look at what voltages you should see on the timing controller or TCON board real quick. Real quickly, I wanted to show you how to release the cable from the timing controller board. This is the bottom cable that goes to the LCD panel. And on this model, it has a little tab and you can just simply flip the tab up. Once the tab is up, the cable actually has a piece you can grab onto and just pull the ribbon cable right out of there. There's the back side, you can see the individual pins on it. To reinsert it, it just goes back, line the little black line up, close the tab back down. Now to release the LVDS cable, it has two squeeze tabs on the side. Gently pull it back, it unplugs. Very hard to see on the camera, but on each end of this, there's a little tab as you press the squeeze tab back in there. I don't know if you can see it on the video or not, but it locks into place. In fact, as you're plugging this in, if you don't squeeze the tabs, you can hear a click on each end as you insert the cable. Okay, so on the timing controller board, you'll notice there's a small fuse right here. The set is off right now, so I should have zero volts on that fuse. So let's go ahead and turn the set on. There we go, 12 volts on the fuse. And that comes from the first couple of pins here on the timing controller, uh, the uh, LVDS, excuse me, ribbon cable. Pin one is ground. Pin two, pin three, pin four, pin five, and pin six are all 12 volts. It feeds the fuse. From the fuse, it feeds the rest of the timing controller board. Uh, normally when you see an inductor or a coil like this, you can actually measure the voltage if you have a good RMS voltmeter. So I've got 12 volts there. I should have a lower voltage on this one, 3.3 volts. That's the output side, 3.3 on the input, or 3.25. Actually, yeah, this is the output side, 3.24. The input side is 3.25. Some voltmeters won't measure this side correctly. It's got to be a good RMS voltmeter. Uh, this is the power supply controller chip on this model right here. Uh, I've had problems with these on previous models, none on this particular model. Actually, there's a couple companies, uh, Shop Jimmy being one that sells a repair kit. comes with a new fuse and it comes with a new power supply controller chip. If you have a problem with distorted video or uh, just uh, no video whatsoever, you can try replacing this chip as well as replacing the fuse. You can test your fuse and see if you've got a problem there as well. Now, the timing controller is what actually takes the LVDS uh, video signal and converts it to the pulses that the LCD panel can use. LVDS stands for Low Voltage Differential Signal, LVDS. And so you can actually see little test pads right here for the parity bits from the main board to the timing controller. If you had an oscilloscope, you could look at these. You can check them with a voltmeter and you'll typically see a, about a volt to a volt and a half on these. Uh, there's always one positive pin and one negative pin, even though they read almost identical. One has positive going pulses and one has neg negative going pulses if you hooked up an oscilloscope to it. And by this you can tell how many bit your panel is, because two, two pins is one bit for the panel. So one, two, three, four, five, six. This would be considered a six bit panel. Uh, some panels are four bit, some are eight bit. Some are 6-bit. Uh, I haven't seen any pass an 8-bit panel. That just refers to how many bits of data go to the panel simultaneously to load memory registers to actually make the picture. It's a very high data rate. The rest of the pins are clock pulses and controller pulses to the LCD panel. Well, I certainly hope you enjoyed the video on voltages and troubleshooting on the Samsung LN32B360. Hopefully with your help, we can keep these units out of the landfill, out of the recycle bin, and keep them up and running longer and longer. They're they're unfortunately not making these new sets as well as they did 20, 30 years ago where you could expect 10 or 15 years out of the sets quite easily. Uh, it seems like the average lifespan of these newer sets 
is anywhere from approximately three to seven years. Uh, once again, I appreciate your views, your comments, your support. I try to answer questions as I can, but unfortunately, uh, I can't get to everybody right now. Uh, once again, thank you for watching. You can follow me on Twitter at NorCal715. Everybody have a great day. Bye-bye.